Afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm going to get straight into it. What? With me, it first seemed like a really strange analogy, but bear with me, guys. Um, I'm going to equate the avian neck to the human arm. Uh, why can we think like that? A lot of people have called the beak and head of birds as a surrogate hand. So I think it's appropriate to extend this analogy proximately, as it were, because the neck positions this surrogate hand to maximise the efficiency of um, manipulating its environment and um, catching prey items, for example. And this has created a lot of extra evolutionary pressure on the neck, and that's kind of this vague hypothesis that the majority of people that have worked on necks in the past of birds, that we see this uh, vast diversity and disparity in, in neck lengths, for example. But it's not really quantitative, it's not a systematic study, so my PhD is really trying to understand the drivers behind this variation uh, of neck length and neck morphology in birds. So are these drivers more ecological to do with diet or locomotory mode? Are they more phylogenetically conserved? Or do we see more biomechanical constraints? And the main biomechanical constraint I'm going to be concerning today is head size, but more on that later. Now this variation is great, it's really interesting, but it's actually kind of a pain in the arse because when you want to study neck elongation in mammals, the homology in a system is pretty apparent. They've got pretty much all seven circle vertebrae, apart from a few abhorrent sloths, but let's not talk about those. But when you want to study um, bird neck elongation, we go from this parrot with 11 or 12 cervical vertebrae to swans with anything up to 26 or 28 cervical vertebrae. So the homology in this system is really the, the struggle that, you know, the struggle is real really when it con concerns this. So how do we overcome this? What metric do we now have to use to gain some aspects of homology, as weird as that may sound? And I think the solution lies in regionalization. Regionalization is really the splitting up of the axial column into distinct units, um, where these distinct, distinct units have distinct flexion patterns, for example. And these are, the boundaries between these regions are controlled by uh, Hox genes. Now recently, as you can see uh, here, it's have been found that in chickens there exist subregions, so regions within regions, um, and in the chicken there's said to be five cervical subregions. So if that's the case for all birds, and all birds have the same number of subregions, I think regionalization is this uh, homologous metric that we should go forward when studying neck elongation. So I'm not a geneticist, so I haven't studied um, Hox genes for my PhD, but the previous study use geometric morphometrics as a good proxy. The geometric morphometrics and the genetics data found the same boundaries. So I digitize about 600 cervical vertebrae, which is fun, of uh, about 52 modern species, subjected that to geometric morphometrics. And there's not a lot of landmarks in here because uh, a lot of the features of anatomy of uh, avian cervical vertebrae change along the column quite drastically. So in that instance where there's um, a low density of landmarks, I've used character, um, analysis. So I've combined the character matrices and the Procrustes coordinates to produce um, principal comp um, coordinates, not components analysis, and cluster analysis. And based on distance measures, uh, and slightly by eye, um, I gain the regions. Now, the first big result of this is that we see five cervical regions across all birds. Not exactly surprising, but it's kind of the big truth that I base my homology on uh, with all my cervical regions. So the first thing we need to note is here that we see a huge range in, in region size between uh, different birds. So going forward, region size, just to remind everybody, is the variation in number of vertebrae per region. So let's look at potentially some drivers behind this uh, range in region size. Is it dietary ecology, like a motor and mode, or is it more phylogenetically conservative? So here I've just plotted basically a normalized plot, oh, a normalized plot of um, the number of vertebrae per region um, across multiple different dietary groups. There's actually very little um, significant variation between the dietary groups. We only see uh, d differences between insectivores and all of the birds in region three. Just to remind you, region three is kind of the medial large region we see here. Um, we also see differences in diet between piscivores and all of the um, groups in region four. We see a very, very similar um, take on this when we look at <coughs> locomotor groups. Very little significant variation between the locomotor uh, modes, apart from in soaring birds where we see region three and four different from all of the birds. So what's going on here? 
my kind of uh, hot take on this is that they're adapting to extremes. So insectivores, they have to use the head to catch small, fast-moving invertebrates. So they require fast, precise head strikes. Piscivores, they're underwater. It's been proved before that this is vastly different cervical kinematics than terrestrial uh, food catching on, in, in, in other birds. And soaring birds is, is, is kind of a bit unusual. It took me a couple of months to sit down and figure this out. But birds, as they fly, um, their flapping motions disturb vision, so they have to bob their heads in order to um, stabilize their gaze. So soaring birds, on average, they're flapping a lot less. So I think that uh, this represents kind of an extreme cervical ki kinematic um, motion where they're not we're adapted to not bobbing their head as much, essentially, in flight. Also, there are quite a lot of piscivorous taxa that soar as well, so that may, might be linked to it as well. So what I'm trying to say here is the only difference we see are to these extreme examples and more generally, birds are adapted to use their neck as kind of a general tool um, to a, a take on the multitude of tasks that their head has to do every day. So what drives it? We don't really see dietary ecology driving it or locomotory mode. I've not even mentioned phylogenetic group because there's no um, correlation at all within phylogenetics. However, we are looking for better methods to incorporate within that. So hit me up if you know a lot about phylogenetics. Um, and we've seen this before. If you've seen me give this talk before, um, <laughs> which a lot of you have, um, <laughs> we've, see, we've seen region shapes so of vertebral morphology shows this exact pattern, whereby generally birds have the same um, vertebral morphology across the entire column, and it only adapts to extreme changes in cervical kinematics, such as, for example, carnivory, because you've got to have a lot of power within that neck to tear flesh from bone. So just what? is this change in region size correlating with? Well, we think back to the neck. Um, head size is obviously has to play a huge um, part in shaping the neck. So if you want a big head, generally you've kind of got to have a shorter neck. But if you want a longer neck, you've kind of got to have a, a smaller head. Now this is going to be one of those vague hypotheses which actually no one's really tested before. Um, so we talk a bit of our data and first thing says we had to find out head mass versus body mass, and then we had to look at neck length versus body mass as well. We're kind of trying to tease apart some allometric relationships here. So when we look at head mass and um, neck length versus body mass, we see a negative alle allometric relationship here, which is not really surprising. But when we try and plot neck length versus head mass, something quite crazy happens. We see this positive allometry between neck length and head mass. So we see a quite large um, heads on long necks, which is absurd. So what, how are birds supporting such long heads? Well, this graph um, we think solves it, and it shows if we look for allometry between region length, so the size of these regions, uh, versus uh, head mass, we see region one and five showing negative allometry, but these middle regions showing positive allometry. Now, granted, looking at this graph doesn't really uh, show you why, but if we take one of my favorite birds, this pelican, and we uh, look at what these regions actually are. Regions one and five showing negative allometry, and these are these regions which support the head and support the craniocervical system as a whole. So they're getting shorter, uh, both in uh, number of cervicals and in length, and that's usually a, a sign that they're uh, adapting to be stiffer, which is what you want with, with uh, vertebrae that support such, you know, the craniocervical system as a whole. And in these regions where we see positive allometry, they're in the middle. So you're getting more vertebra here, uh, which in birds means more flexion. So that allows, for example, this pelican, huge head. It's not right on the end of its body. It's tucked in more proximally towards the center of mass. So it has to do less work to hold up a heavier head. So I think regionalization here is adapting in this allometric fashion in order to account for a larger head size. So what I think is going on here is um, yes, the neck is quite general, but that allows it to have a, uh, to provide us uh, the head as a support system. So the head can adapt to all these wonderful and wacky niches we see birds in, and that's fine because the neck's got its back essentially. This is um, really early work, but we've seen that region size doesn't really correlate with ecology apart from extremes. We've seen that cervical regionalization seems to aid in general tasks rather than specific. Um, functionals, niches, and 
we see cervical region size doesn't really correlate with head mass. Well, so, sorry, it does correlate with head mass. Um, I think cervical, regionalizing re cervical regionalization supports a wide variety of head sizes that birds seem to adapt to, to in their various ecological niches. This is the first step. Uh, we really want to study range of motion. We really want to get into the nitty gritty of dissection to see if this holds true when you go back to you know, your classical gross mor morphological studies. Um, I think necks are a really cool system. They're quite understudied. So if anybody fancies collaboration or just chat about next afterwards, come find me. But yeah, thanks for listening. Any questions, I'd happy to take them. <laughs>